die as more of patient. We, we have we had a free and excellent speakers, uh, uh, putting the expectations far up. Uh, 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 first, we're going to start with Parisa Musadi, who's an assistant professor of philosophy at, at, uh, at the University of York, York University. <laughs> uh, uh, and then, uh, and th then we're going to move to you're going to yeah, Josh Skorberg, who's a, a, a associate professor of philosophy at uh, um, University of Guelph, and then. Uh, Karina Both, Bo, who is assistant professor of philosophy of the Institute of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. Wow, I am so proud of myself. <laughs> so I, I'm really looking forward. This is going to be a great panel. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, thank you for inviting us here. We are here to talk about. Um, whether artificial intelligence or AI can or will become moral patients. Um, and what we mean by a moral patient is something that is owed moral consideration. It's the kind of thing that can be morally wronged and needs moral protection. So moral patiency is a moral status that we think some beings have and others don't. For example, we all think that our fellow human beings are moral patients in this sense. We owe them moral consideration. We have moral reasons to treat them well, not harm them, and so on. Um, on the other hand, we don't think that everyday inanimate objects, like my sweater or my water bottle, um, are the kind of thing that can be morally wronged. Uh, but this doesn't mean that you have to be necessarily a human being or a person to have this moral status. Animals, for example, are widely considered to be moral patients as well. They may not have as much moral protection as human beings, but as the supporters of human rights and um, animal rights would like to remind us, um, we do have moral reasons to treat them well as well. So our question today is whether AI can be a moral patient too. And of course, we are thinking about AIs of the future, mainly. Because people don't think that currently existing AIs um, are moral patients. But a lot of people are worried about this. So they're thinking about AIs of the future, thinking that at some point, perhaps we might have to give them moral protections, legal rights, and so on. So my position about this question is that these worries are all unnecessary and ultimately misguided. Um, and I, for one, am not worried about this. And I want to argue that you shouldn't be either. Um, before I get to the reasons why I'm not worried, um, I should clarify that I won't be claiming that it is impossible for an AI to ever become a moral patient. And my point isn't that an artificial machine being a moral patient is somehow inconceivable or logically impossible. It's rather that I think we don't have any good reasons to think, to positively think that AIs will in fact become moral patients. I think the usual reasons that are given for this um, are misguided. So things like AI's increasing degree of autonomy and independence from us are not good reasons to worry about their moral status. OK, the first thing I want to do is to define moral patiency a little bit more precisely, because there are some other concepts in the neighborhood that we have to distinguish it from. Um, so I'll start with that. I said that a moral patient is a being with moral consideration and reasons to treat it a certain way. But if you think about it, there are moral reasons to treat objects like a sweater or a water bottle in a certain way as well. Somebody going around and just destroying water bottles um, isn't going to be exactly unproblematic because it would be wasteful, perhaps you know, it would belong to somebody and destroy someone's property. So um, why don't we say that the water bottle is a moral patient? That's because our moral concern in these cases is not about the bottle itself. It's because the bottle has some kind of use for somebody that we are worried about it. You know, somebody can use it or somebody needs the bottle. So although the bottle does have some value that we need to take into consideration when we're trying to act morally, this value is purely instrumental. It's um, because of 
its instrumental relation to others that it has this value. Um, if it is stopped serving a purpose for us, it would be completely okay to destroy it. In contrast, um, the concern that we have to our fellow human beings is not due to their serving any particular instrumental purpose. We're supposed to treat other people as well, morally speaking, regardless of whether they serve a need for us. And precisely in virtue of the kind of thing that they are and this, their status as moral patients, which is beings with intrinsic value, beings that matter in their own right as an end. Another aspect of being a moral patient um, is that moral patients need to be treated well for their own sake, not just instrumentally in their own right, um, not just not, in, not intrinsically or non-instrumentally and in their own right, but also for their own sake. To see this, contrast the value of a human being with a value of a piece of art. You might think that a piece of art like the Mona Lisa has intrinsic value. So it's not just instrumentally valuable because you can sell it or you can do things with it, but also valuable in itself because of its aesthetic properties. Um, so you might think it's a good thing to preserve as an end in its own right, but this is not to say that we owe something to the painting for the sake of the painting itself. The painting itself doesn't benefit from being saved or being treated in a certain way. Um, doesn't have an interest in uh, being saved. So even when we value it non-instrumentally, the value of the painting is still a value for us. Um, it's somehow tied to us and our ability to appreciate art, perceive its aesthetic value, and so on. In contrast, the moral consideration that we owe to other human beings, we owe to them for their own sake. They benefit from being, being saved, being treated well. And so Things that are moral patients matter not just in their own right, but also for their own sake. Now, this aspect of being a moral patient, uh, the ability to benefit or be harmed by our treatment, is very important for answering our question about whether AIs will one day become moral patients. This, this is a necessary condition that a future AI will have to meet in order to acquire the relevant moral status. It has to matter morally not just instrumentally because of the purpose it serves, but in its own right. And it has to matter for its own sake, which is to say that it has to also receive benefit and harm. That's sort of interests of its own that can be promoted or frustrated. The term that's often used to refer to this condition is having a good of one's own, or having interests, or having a welfare. Now, what kind of things already meet this condition? Um, there is actually some disagreement about this. Some philosophers think that only sentient beings, um, which are able to perceive things and experience pleasure and pain, can be welfare subjects. Um, so they think that if you don't have the capacity for subjective experience or consciousness, then you can't receive benefit or harm. In contrast, there are other philosophers who argue that sentience or consciousness is not required for having a good of one's own, and particularly in the context of environmental ethics, some philosophers claim that non-sentient living things, like plants, also can receive benefit and harm. So if you cut down a tree, you are in fact harming it. Uh, because even though it doesn't feel pain, um, a tree is the kind of thing that you know, can benefit or harm from. It, it, it has the goal of growing and um, it wants to continue to live and so on, wants to, in a sense. So it has a biological interest in staying alive. I don't want to settle this particular debate here. I determine whether sentience is required for having interests or not. But I want to argue that future AIs won't qualify for moral patiency, regardless of whether sentience is required for having interests. So I will argue that even if non-sentient beings, like plants, can potentially have interests, we still shouldn't worry about AIs acquiring this status and becoming moral patients. And the way I want to make this argument is by starting from the case of simple artifacts, simple everyday familiar artifacts like my water bottle, um, which we can agree do not meet the necessary condition. Um, and then I want to argue that no matter how much artificial intelligence you add to these artifacts, 
that intelligence is not going to take them any closer to uh, becoming moral patients. So the first thing I need to do in order to make this argument is explaining why it is that we don't think simple artifacts have interests of their own. Because if you think about it, even with um, things like this water bottle, we can talk about things being good or bad for them in a sense. You know, you can say hand washing is good for the water bottle or putting it in the dishwasher is bad for it. Um, so why don't we think that the water bottle or any other everyday object or artifact has a good of its own? This is a question that environmental ethicists who want to argue that non-sentient living things have interests um, have had to deal with because both in the case of organisms, like trees, and artifacts, like a water bottle, we seem to have the same basis for talking about what's good or bad for them. Neither of them are sentient beings, uh, so it's not that they subjectively care, but there is a sense in which they're both goal-directed and functionally organized entities. They're both assigned goals. Um, they're both composed of parts and aspects that are assigned functions. And these goals and functions give us a basis for talking about what is good or bad for them. A tree, for example, is a living thing and as such has biological goals such as growing and staying alive, and its parts have functions that help it achieve these goals. We can, we can say the roots of the tree um, have the function of drying water and nutrients, and the trunk has the function of keeping it upright, and so on. Um, and these functions and goals give us the basis for talking about what's good or bad for the tree. Um, we can say, the reason we can say watering the tree is good for the tree or cutting it down is bad for it is because doing these things affects the functionings of the parts of the tree. So what is good for the tree enables its parts to function well. What is bad for the tree um, frustrates these functions. And similarly, in the case of artifacts, um, we ascribe goals and functions to the artifacts and their parts. And we say, for example, that this bottle is for drinking, ascribing a goal. And the cap of the bottle has the function of keeping the water from spilling. Um, and these goals and functions seem to give us the same kind of basis for talking about what is good or bad for the bottle. If the cap of the bottle breaks, um, the, because we put it in the dishwasher, it won't be able to do its function, so that's why we can say it's bad for the water bottle. So why is it that we don't really think that simple artifacts like this meet the necessary condition of having interests of their own? I think the difference between artifacts and organisms has to do with the kind of goals and functions that we ascribe in each case. And the fact that in the case of artifacts, these functions have a particular relation to us, kind of dependence on us. And this dependence means that uh, what we say is good or bad for the artifact is really an extension of what is good or bad for us. If we examine these goals and functions that we ascribe to artifacts and their parts, we can see that they are derivative of our goals and interests and intentions. So again, take the water bottle. What is the function of the bottle? It's um, you know, keeping some water in, enabling me to drink it, and so on. And these are things that I'm interested in. Notice that the bottle has many other capacities besides the ones that we consider its function. It can collect dust, it can break to pieces, it can potentially leak, but we don't consider these capacities to be the bottle's function, and we don't consider the bottle's failure to realize these capacities to be a malfunction or a bad thing. Um, the fact that my bottle doesn't leak is not a bad thing, it's not a failure, it's actually a good thing. So what determines that? Nothing about the intrinsic physical features of the bottle says that not leaking is good and leaking is bad. Um, it's our interests, our goals and intentions when we make the bottle or when we use the bottle that determines what the bottle's proper function is and what counts as malfunctioning for the bottle. If you remove humans and their interests and their intentions from the earth, the bottle wouldn't even have a function there wouldn't be a sense in which keeping the water in would be good for the bottle or leaking would be bad. In contrast, the functions that we ascribe to the parts and aspects of living things don't depend on any kind of instrumental relation to us. 
And we say that the function of the roots of the tree is to draw water. This function is independent of our goals, our interests, what we care about. Seems to be a judgment purely about um, the tree itself, aside from its relation to us. So this is why the goals and functions that we ascribe to living things are really different from the ones that we ascribe to artifacts. And in the case of artifacts, they are merely derivative. They're just an extension of our goals and interests. And to the extent that someone benefits from the success of these goals, that beneficiary is us. So the fact that artifacts are goal-directed or functionally organized does not imply that they have their own interests or they have a good of their own. So that's why they don't meet the necessary condition of moral patience. Now, having identified this uh, difference between simple artifacts and living things, I want to argue that adding artificial intelligence to artifacts does not take them any closer to having interests of their own and becoming moral patients. And to make this argument, I'm going to focus on the process and the mechanism by which AIs increase their intelligence, and the mechanism that helps them to improve their performance become more and more sophisticated to the point that we can call them intelligent um, rather than you know, simple artifacts. And that is the process of machine learning. Machine learning algorithms are what enables a computer program to increase its knowledge and improve its way of solving problems. Traditional computer programs, which do not have machine learning, have a fixed algorithm. They get some input, they process it according to the algorithm that's already given, um, and they produce some output as a result. But machine learning programs are different in that they, um, their algorithm is not fully specified, it's not fully fixed. They have a mechanism that enables them to learn and improve and change the algorithm. For instance, by studying examples of successful performance and coming up with a new algorithm, a new method that can produce that result. And because of this ability to improve and change, machine learning programs can solve many problems that traditional programs have not been able to solve, including programs that even humans struggle to solve. Um, so they can beat humans in games like chess, or they can improve the accuracy of cancer diagnosis and things like that. And of course, this capacity for change and improvement has made a lot of people think that, well, AIs are going to ultimately break free from our influence and from even our understanding. Um, so this is kind of one of the reasons people think that AIs are going to become more and more uh, independent, so they aren't going to be limited to the goals and functions that we define for them. And they're going to acquire new goals and functions that are not determined by us at which point we would be forced to admit that they have their own goals and they have their own interests in the same way that living things have their own goals and interests. And so to illustrate this possibility, um, Nick Bostrom, who's one of the influential philosophers working on the future of AI, invites us to consider an imaginary machine learning algorithm that is tasked with making paper clips. Uh, suppose it's an extremely sophisticated and skilled algorithm that's gradually been improving and optimizing its paperclip making process. And one day it learns that in order to make more paperclips, it needs to somehow safeguard its power supply to keep it from being shut down. Um, so it generates a defense mechanism that makes sure no one can turn it off. And then it learns that the best resource for some key material that it can use for making um, paper clips um, is derived from, can be derived from a resource that humans heavily rely on. So ultimately, even it will even go as far as destroying us by consuming this resource that our survival depends on. And so in this way, the paper clip maker can kind of pose even an existential risk for us. But also, it really seems that we have a machine that is pursuing its own goals independently of what we value or what we are even aware of. However, as I said, I want to argue that this way of thinking about AI is mistaken. And uh, if you look closer at this example and other cases like this, we'll see that the changes that result from machine learning do not make a relevant difference to whether algorithms 
really acquire goals and functions of their own, of the kind that can amount to having interests of their own and ultimately being moral patients. And the reason is that even though a learning algorithm can give rise to new goals and functions, these new goals and functions will still be derivative of our goals and our interests in the same way that the goals and functions that we ascribe to the water bottle are derivative. To see this, notice again that a goal or a function is not just any capacity that something has or any behavior that something does regularly. Um, so for example, just because the climate is changing and the global average temperature is rising, um, we don't think that the Earth has the goal of becoming warmer. Because when you ascribe a goal to something, there is an implied normativity. Um, you're saying that it's supposed to do something, and not doing that would be a kind of failure. We don't think that the air is not getting warmer would be a failure, because we don't think it's a goal. So similarly, just because an AI like the paperclip maker starts doing something regularly, like safeguarding its power supply or consuming our resource, doesn't follow that these are genuine goals for the algorithm. To the extent that it makes sense to see these things as goals for the algorithm, um, to say that you know the algorithm does really have the goal of safeguarding its power supply, it's because for doing these things, it's because something like protecting its power supply is going to serve the goal of making paper clips. That's how we come to see that as a goal, is that there is an instrumental relation between keeping the power on and making paper clips. One is a means to the other, uh, so keeping the power on becomes an intermediate goal, one that is a goal and the way to achieving this ultimate goal of making more paper clips. So the same way that I might have the goal of getting in shape, and as a means of achieving this goal, I can adopt the intermediate goal of going to the gym. Um, so I can, you know, this is how new goals can arise, but the status of the intermediate goal still depends on my further goal of getting in shape. You know, if I stop caring about getting in shape, then going to the gym will no longer be a goal. So similarly for the algorithm, the status of the intermediate goal, like safeguarding the power supply, will be contingent upon the further goal of making paper clips. And this further goal is a derivative one that we imposed on the algorithm because we presumably care about making paper clips and are interested in that. So the fact that the algorithm has now found new ways to achieve this goal, um, maybe achieve it more efficiently or more creatively and more robustly, doesn't make a difference to the nature of this goal, which is derivative of our goals and interests. So the learning process doesn't really give rise to any new ultimate goals or interests for the algorithm that are really the algorithm's own. So that's why I think artificial intelligence um, is not going to make the difference. Adding artificial intelligence to traditional artifacts is not going to make the moral patience. The process of creating intelligence, such as machine learning, makes artifacts better and better at what we can call instrumental reasoning or means end reasoning. When AI is at its best, it's very good at taking the necessary steps to performing the task that it is given in a way that is fast and efficient, perhaps creative and novel. It can plan ahead, can predict the utility of various steps. But uh, there is no reason to think that any of that is going to make AI acquire its own interests, such that we could um, say that it genuinely receives benefit and harm. So this is why I don't think we have any reason to worry about AIs one day becoming moral patients, um, one day requiring moral consideration, protection, and so on. So I, I don't think we have any more moral reason that we already do in the case of water bottles. Um, but people don't worry about water bottles becoming moral patients, of course. So they shouldn't about AIs either. So that's my... Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to move straight to that. Yeah. yeah no, okay. I will use slides. Oh, yes. Do you mind moving there just so that you're captured by someone? Yeah, it's there. Well, uh, 
Oh, it was there for a second. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Can you make it one of the controls at the front row? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. perfect. Good. Mm -hmm. It's still difficult to oh, see. Oh, the video is not working. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It's a little better, yeah. 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 Well, thanks everyone uh, for coming out like a beautiful spring day and right before a long weekend. Um, so uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, it's a topic that I've thought a lot about and didn't have the chance to you know, put pen to paper until this um, uh, event. So um, bear with me as I work out some of the kinks here. Um, okay. So um, I'm glad Parisa went before me. Uh, so I have a sort of more permissive view. Um, and so it'll be it'll be fun to work this out, I think, in conversation. So I think the question about whether or not AI can be a moral patient um, is a lot like Chomsky's famous question of whether you know a submarine can swim. And I think in both cases, there's exactly one right answer to those questions. And that correct answer is it depends what you mean by moral patient or it depends what you mean by swim. Um, and so uh, what I think I want to do in this talk um, is offer a kind of a limitivist argument about moral patiency. Um, and AI ethics. And so the suggestion will be that uh, the way that uh, philosophers have usually thought about the idea of moral patiency um, is not going to be helpful um, or desirable for dealing with some of the problems that are likely to be raised by AI systems. Um, so why is that? Like, like, why do I think moral patiency is, is um, not the right concept? So uh, the first is this idea um, from moral psychology of, of what's known as moral typecasting. So this is a finding due to Kurt Gray and Dan Wegner. Um, and basically what they find in this 2009 study is that um, people tend to perceive agency and patiency as inverses, right? Such that um, perceiving an entity as an agent, uh, we tend to perceive it as therefore not a patient. And when, when we perceive something as a patient, we tend to perceive it as not an agent, right? So they're, they're almost sort of mutually exclusive in the way that we tend to, um, to perceive these things. And um, if that finding is, is reliable and it's on the right track, um, it strikes me as, you know, exactly the wrong way that we should then be thinking about the kind of AI systems that are now being built and are likely to be built in the near future. Um, and so, um, you know, mainly I think that uh, there are cases to be made, as, as some philosophers have, that, you know, perhaps uh, AI systems can come to have something like moral status or moral consideration or moral patience precisely in virtue of their rational agency. Right. So Patrick Butlin, you know, has recently made what I take as a pretty convincing argument that uh, sort of specified forms of, of model based reinforcement learning agents are capable of acting for reasons in the way that philosophers tend to talk about the capacity of acting for reasons. Um, and I think he kind of correctly diagnoses this, this tendency that you see out of this goal. We used to say a rational agency was this one thing. But so I guess we meant something else. Um, and so I guess the, the, the sort of worry here is that if by patiency we tend to mean not agent, then that's going to be incredibly unhelpful for thinking about what kinds of obligations we might have um, towards AI. Um, so I will say, too, that I, I think that moral patiency and moral status are often used interchangeably. And I think some of the same worries that, that I have about moral patiency will apply in a similar way to discussions about moral status. And so one of the arguments... Um, uh, in the talk today, basically, is that um, very often when we talk about moral status, that's really just a shorthand way of talking about what Dave DeGrazia calls the four R's. So rights, um, rules, reasons, and wrongs. And so the claim for today is that, like, I don't want, I don't think it's going to be helpful to talk about something like moral status or moral patience writ large. Instead, I'm going to urge it's more useful to talk about specific rights, rules, reasons, and wrongs that are going to be indexed to or aligned with specific capabilities of specific kinds of AI systems, right? So, so that's, that's the, the claim we'll try to defend. And so to do that, um, I want to draw a parallel with uh, um, a recent argument that's been made in the context of the bioethics literature, a sort of a limitivist argument about personhood. Um, so this paper was just published a few months ago by um, Jenny Blumenthal Barbie, uh, sort of arguing for, you know, the, the end of using the normative concept of personhood in bioethics debates. Um, and so uh, there's two takeaways from this paper that I want to highlight that I think tell us important lessons about the case of uh, what we might owe AI. So um, the first, you know, among uh, she gives a couple arguments in the paper, but I think the one that's the most salient for these purposes 
Um, she thinks that we ought to discard talk about personhood and bioethics debates, among other reasons, um, because it conflicts with folk intuitions or with lay intuitions um, about personhood. So I'll say a bit more about that. Um, and second, she thinks that, you know, um, instead of uh, sort of trying to theorize what the nature of personhood is and then sorting entities into persons or not persons and seeing what follows, she suggests that we just ask more direct normative questions. And I'll give some examples of those, but this strikes me as exactly the right strategy for thinking about AI as well. Um, and so by analogy, the argument for today is that um, uh, I, I'm going to argue that we should uh, sort of put an end to the talk of moral patiency um, in AI ethics. All right. So um, uh, in this paper, um, Blumenthal Barbie uh, sort of does a little like autoethnography, right, where she, you know, she's a bioethicist and she talks about research that she was conducting with family members of um, patients who were in like persistent vegetative states or, or minimally conscious states. Um, and, you know, she says, like, look, I'm a philosopher. I, I come to these questions, you know, through the lens of personhood. So in bioethics, going all the way back to the you know, 60s and 70s and the abortion debates, right, personhood was the kind of primarily, primary conceptual framework that we used to think about these cases. And, you know, um, they sort of designed these survey instruments to, to interview family members of minimally conscious patients through the lens of, like, personhood. And then she describes the experience of, you know, going to talk to these patients' family members and, you know, they just thought it was weird and even sometimes offensive. Like, what do you mean my husband's not a person? Like, why would you even, how could you even suggest that? And so she says, you know, it becomes very clear very quickly to her research team that, like, there's just a very different sense in the way that philosophers think about the concept of personhood um, as it rely, you know, as it relates to what sort of moral or legal obligations we have to people in um, persistent vegetative states. And then the way the family members who are directly impacted by these conditions think about it. Right. So Hilda Lindemann has often, um, the feminist philosopher, has written, I think, pretty poignantly about this. Um, so in her 2016 book, Holding and Letting Go, you know, she describes the case of her uh, you know, um, infant sister, you know, 18 months old, who um, uh, passed away from hydrocephaly, um, hydrocephalacy when she was seven years old. And she says, look, if you had asked the family members whether she was a person, we would have pitied you for being a philosopher and said, of course. Right. Um, and so I think that this kind of conflict between sort of philosophical notions on the one hand and lay intuitions on the other is especially salient when we're trying to provide normative guidance, right? So when ethicists are trying to do the work of like making recommendations or sort of telling people what to do, it's just not gonna be helpful to like dig in your heels and say, no, 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 but like this is what the philosophical framework says and you're just mistaken, right? If you think that personhood isn't relevant. Um, so insofar as that's the aim of ethics, right? Is, is to get us to think about what you know, how we should tell AI designers to build systems or, or what policy should be made around them. I think we just can't ignore folk intuitions about the, um, the, the subject matter. Um, so what does that mean in the case of AI? So, so that was the parallel with bioethics in the case of uh, persistent vegetative states. How does that apply to the case of AI moral patiency? Well, I think we're already living in a world where uh, people are making attributions and descriptions to AI systems uh, they're attributing to AI systems the very kinds of properties that are often thought to ground moral status or moral patience. So it's not uncommon to hear people talking about AI systems as, you know, being conscious or having uh, some kind of inner phenomenology or, or sort of having emotional states. Um, and so this is especially salient in what Henry Shevlin has called, you know, social AIs. So AI systems that are explicitly designed to play social roles. Um, those are that explicitly designed to be companions. So the case of like replica AI, which some of you may be familiar with, is probably the most, I think, newsworthy instance of this. And so, so we can talk more about that case in, in the um, Q and A if you're interested. Um, and so, I'm also particularly interested in this recent finding by um, Clara Colombato, who's a psychologist at University of Waterloo. And so, she's got this preprint showing that um, the more time people spend with an AI system, so in her study, it's it's with users of ChatGPT, um, the more likely they are to attribute something like an inner phenomenology to the AI. So, you know, the, the more familiarity you have, the more time you spend using these tools in terms of self-report, the more likely you are to agree with statements like, you know, it seems like there might be an inner experience here, or it seems like this thing is, is conscious. Now, the first thing to say here, of course, is that these attributions are almost assuredly mistaken, right? This is almost, you know, like quite clearly an instance of misplaced anthropomorphism. Um, and I think it's also obviously and equally true that these kinds of things are going to become more and more prevalent, right? So as more and more people turn to AI companions and develop increasingly complex and nuanced relationships with AI agents, um, these descriptions are going to become more and more common. This just seems, you know, patently obvious to me. 
Um, and so uh, I think the argument I want to draw on the reason I like the analogy with the bioethics case is that I think, you know, on sort of standard philosophical theories of what consciousness is or what, you know, an inner phenomenology is, you know, it's probably just, you know, almost assuredly true that large language models don't exhibit those inner states. Um, but in a way, I want to say that that like fact of the matter about it is, is, is sort of a separate question from general perceptions about it, right? And so in the same way that uh, it's not helpful for bioethicists or sort of people doing clinical ethics consultations, they can't just ignore, you know, folk intuitions or the way their stakeholders think about these things, right? I think the same is true for AI ethicists, right? We can't just sort of dismiss people talking about their AI girlfriends as being just obviously mistaken and therefore discount their testimony, right? I think it needs to be taken seriously insofar as we're interested in providing our guidance and you know, providing input to policy. Right. And I think to ignore those folk intuitions or those lay intuitions about ascribing these states to AI, I think ethicists ignore that at their at their peril. Um, OK, so what follows from this? So in the um, in the kind of bioethics case, um, here's what Blumenthal Barbie says. She says, in the case of personhood, rather than arguing about whether a certain creature gets counted as a person or not, and then drawing conclusions about what we do or do not owe to them on that basis, we instead ought to ask and analyze important normative questions more directly. For example, about what kinds of interests a being has, what kind of respect it deserves, and what it might require of us. And so in this paper, she points to the example of the recent um, developments and sort of you know, philosophical theorizing on, on welfare subjectivity as a good example of this. Um, and it's one that I'll return to uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, what does this look like in the case of AI moral patiency? Um, well, as I mentioned at the outset, I think that most questions that fall under the heading of moral status or moral patiency are just reducible, right? There, it's a shorthand way of talking about which kinds of entities are protected by rules, rights, wrongs, and reasons. Um, and so, uh, um, what I want to do is sort of connect up some of the, the bioethics claims I've made with with a recent paper by some of my collaborators, Walter Senator Armstrong, and um, and Vince Conitzer, um, who point out that it's you know for a theory of moral status, it's preferable to align the different features of an affected entity as the basis of different rights, reasons, and rules and wrongs that apply to that entity, right? So in other words, the rights that an entity has should be indexed to the specific capacities that that entity has and the specific kind of vulnerabilities that that entity might have. So for example, the right not to be caused pain seems to just require something like sentience, right? It seems to require the ability to feel pleasure and pain in the first place. Whereas the right to freedom presumably involves something like the ability to engage in goal-directed thought and make ration, um, um, making rational choices. Right? So um, uh, what I want to do then is just think for a second about the kinds of rights that babies have. Okay, So babies clearly have the right not to be caused pain. Right? This is probably in virtue of the fact that they are you know, mammals and they have a you know, developed system, even at a very young age, for feeling um, pleasure and pain. So it's quite clear that they have a right not to be caused pain. Now, it's less clear to me that babies or infants have um, a right to something like freedom or freedom of movement. And so maybe one reason you might think that babies don't have the right to freedom is they don't have the right kind of access consciousness to sort of integrate considerations in the way that you would need to make a rational decision, for example, about what's a good time to go to bed, as any you know, new parent will uh, um, sort of be fully aware. They can't be rational about when it's time to go to bed and, and when it's good to be awake or asleep. Um, and so I think that like recognizing the ways that babies have some rights, but not other kinds of rights, right? They clearly have the right not to be caused pain. They clearly don't have the right of freedom of movement. That precisely explains why it is that it's not morally wrong to swaddle babies, right? Even though they're wriggling, they're sort of moving around, might make you think they don't really want to be swaddled. No one thinks you're a morally bad person for swaddling a baby. It's like you sort of know. I know you don't think it's going to help you sleep, but it's going to help you sleep. Um, but it's sort of you know not morally wrong to do that. And I think recognizing that the capacities that they have give rise to certain rights and not other rights uh, provides a sort of really clean explanation of that fact. Right. So now I want to consider another case that's brought up in this paper by um, by Walter and Vince. And so they imagine. You know that you're it's maybe in the not too distant future and you know a sort of like robo vacuum is in the town square vacuuming noisily while you're trying to take a phone call right and so you're trying to like take this phone call and maybe you just go to the robot and you just say hey man like i gotta take this phone call can you please just go vacuum somewhere else for five more minutes and then you know like then i'll be off the phone and then you can come over here 
right? And then so suppose the vacuum, the robot vacuum, you know, decides that, well, actually I'd be better able to achieve my own goals of cleaning the square if I indeed do go away and then come back later. And then the question they ask in the paper is like, well, does the robot now have a right that you leave in five minutes like you promised that you would? And my intuition is that it does, um, that it does have a right that you leave in five minutes like you said it would. And I think what's crucial about that right is that it doesn't depend at all on having anything like consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, subjective experience, qualitative experience. Right? So to sort of recap, right, if an AI cannot feel pain, it doesn't make sense to give it a right to not be caused pain. So the sort of right is indexed to the specific capacity. Um, but even if it doesn't feel pain, that doesn't tell us, it's not enough to show that it doesn't have any other moral rights because it might have other kinds of rights that are unconnected to like subjective experience. So if it has the ability to plan, then it you know, might have a right to like not have its plan frustrated without good reason. Um, you know, it might have a right to have its promises honored. And notice that none of that depends on anything about the ability to feel pain or, or be conscious or not. Um, so you know, how, how Walter and Vince catch this out is they say, look, an AI that does not feel pain could still access information and use it to make choices about what's the most efficient way to you know, clean this public square. It can have goals, it can perform tasks, subtasks within those goals. It could then have the kind of access consciousness that's needed for rational decisions. And that's the kind of thing that could be the basis for a moral right to freedom that seems just totally independent of like the ability to feel pleasure and pain. Um, so you might just say like, whoa, wait a minute. Like Gus just said that, you know, like AI robot vacuums have rights. Um, yeah, I did actually. Like that's that's the claim I'm willing to defend. And what I want to sort of conclude with is by suggesting that it's not actually that radical um, and that there's nothing that's sort of that monumental about it. And I know it makes all these press headlines when we give robots citizenship and stuff. Like, I don't think it's that newsworthy. Right. So um, here's the thing to remember that I think often gets missed in a lot of these debates about moral status. Right. Rights are not absolute. Almost no right we have is absolute. Um, rules can be justifiably violated. Reasons can be overridden. And what's you know, morally wrong in one context is morally right in another context. Right. So these things are not absolutes. Um, so to say that an AI has moral status is not to say it's always and everywhere immoral to deceive it, coerce it, disable it, turn it off. Right. It's only to say that it's morally wrong to do so when there is not enough reason to do so. Right? So my claim here is basically that in many and perhaps most cases, we are going to have more than enough reason to override the rights that we might assign to an AI system. Right? So to do this, I want to draw another analogy, another sort of parallel with um, Gwen Bradford's recent analysis on the relationship between consciousness and, and welfare subjectivity. Um, so in, in her um, 2023 paper, you know, she, she sort of is at pains, I think, and, and does, you know, this like, I, I think a, a very convincing job of rejecting this really widespread view in philosophy. Um, and Parisa sort of um, uh, referred to this view, right? That consciousness is required for welfare subjectivity, right? So the idea of like, if you don't experience something as good, it couldn't be good for you. And she thinks that that view is sort of often taken for granted, but never really well motivated or, or defended. Um, and so uh, her claim is like, if you reject that view, it's definitely going to be the case that there's going to be this explosion of welfare subjects, right? So if you don't require consciousness for being a welfare subject, then it looks like there's a lot more things that all of a sudden count as welfare subjects. It may include robots, like in the you know thought experiment a second ago, it may include Roombas, some plants, and many other surprising things. This is counterintuitive, she says. Um, if we assume, as is commonly assumed, that welfare generates normative reasons, it turns out that on this view, we might have reasons to make the world a better place you know, by giving robots more knowledge, um, providing them more opportunities to satisfy their desires, letting the weeds in the garden flourish, right? And so I think this sort of straightforwardly follows from the way most people think about welfare subjectivity and normative reasons. Um, but her view, and it's one that I sort of want to adopt for the case of AI, is that it's actually not that counterintuitive. Right? There's actually not that much radical here, right? She says the reason is very simple. The value of relevant states is very small compared to the value of such states when they are possessed by conscious creatures, right? So everyone agrees, you know, that like it would be better to have a desire to sort of have a, a welfare good that you experience as good. Um, so the example she gives in the paper is like, you know, the prisoner who has a desire that their daughter flourishes. Now they're in prison, of course, so, you know, they, they might not ever know, they might not ever have contact with them. And like everyone agrees that it would be good for the prisoner if his daughter flourished and it would be even better if he was aware of it. But 
on the view she's defending, right? It can still be good for him, even if he's never aware of it. But everyone would agree that it would, of course, be better if he did experience it. Right? And so when you sort of see that comparison or that contrast that's made, uh, the idea is like everyone agrees that something consciously experienced is better than not. So even if we do grant that there is a value to sort of non-conscious welfare goods, um, it's going to be pretty easy. And she's got some nice sort of proofs for this in the paper showing that like it's always going to be overridden. It's always going to be swamped by the value of consciously experienced welfare goods, right? So granting things that like, yeah, maybe plants, you know, or animals or Roombas can have welfare goods. Well, maybe, um, probably, but they're just going to be swamped by the considerations of those that are experienced by conscious entities, right? And so this is the analogy I want to make in the case of AI ethics, right? So the properly indexed rights of AI systems are almost always going to be significantly smaller and narrower. They're not absolute, they can be overridden, they can be justifiably violated, right? So to say that we can grant that in that case, you know, the robot has a right that you leave the square in five minutes, it's like, yeah, it has a right, um, but it's the kind of right that many sorts of cases that we care about, there would be no problem at all in just saying, look, the human interests just outweigh those of, of the robot, right? It's not to say it doesn't have rights, it's just to say that the kinds of rights that we have are almost always gonna be Trump's, and maybe not always, um, but it sort of just seems to follow um, in, in I, I think, sort of structurally similar way to the argument that, that, that Gwen makes in the paper about consciousness and, and um, welfare subjectivity, right? So I think that this um, sort of argument I'm making has, has a really nice upshot. So um, Eric Schweitzgable has, you know, he published this paper, like Karina had a, um, uh, a sort of piece in, in the same volume where he talks about this, you know, so-called dilemma of creating these gray area, AIs where we're like not quite sure if they're sentient or not. And so he says, well, anytime you do that, there's going to be this dilemma that you face. So if we're not quite sure, we can make mistakes in two directions, right? So one is that we could um, over attribute moral status, right? So we could make the mistake of assuming that an AI is conscious or sentient when it's not. The other mistake you could make is under attributing moral status, right? Mistakenly assuming that an AI has consciousness or sentience when it in fact doesn't. And so for him, this is a dilemma because he imagines this case where, okay, so it's the far future. We have this, you know, way more advanced chat bot. And uh, it seems like it's the kind of thing that should be given moral status or consideration or some kind of right. But then all of a sudden this chat bot starts, you know, spewing racist nonsense and inciting people to violence. And he says, well, this is a dilemma because we're not going to be able to turn it off because it has rights. And so that's the bullet we're going to have to bite. And he sees no way out of this dilemma. And my view is just like, there's an easy way out of that dilemma. The chatbot has a right. It might have a right to free expression. It's just that that right is clearly overridden by the interests of humans in that case, right? So it's not as if by assigning moral considerations and rights, they have to be absolute, non-overridable. You could never sort of provide a justification for overriding them. And my view is that in many cases, if we do it, we're still gonna have good moral reasons to think that like paradigmatic cases of human rights are going to trump those of, of AI. Um, and so that's sort of the, I think, an upshot of the view is that it gets out of this dilemma that is, I think, characterized by some of the recent debate um, about the moral status of, uh, about AI. So um, thanks for listening. Happy to turn it over to Karina. Thank you. We should start there. Okay. Um, okay, great. So yes, thank you uh, everyone for sticking around right for the long weekend. Um, it's fun to go third because I'm spending the whole time like trying to position myself, like where am I falling between these talks? So I'm like, I don't actually know. I'm, <laughs> we'll just, we'll see what you guys think. Um, 
Okay, so yes, so thank you for having me, Sergio. Um, I'm going to also introduce some sort of like new ideas, working it out. Um, so I'm tentatively calling this um, the artificial moral patiency dilemma that I'll um, go through and articulate. It's not quite the dilemma that um, Gus just mentioned uh, from Eric Schwitzgabel, although I will talk about um, Eric's work. Um, so this is the dilemma as I see it, and I'll work through each of these claims. So um, first um, is the claim that we have good reasons to want to build moral agents. Um, second is the claim that we have good reasons to not want to build moral patients. Um, third is the claim that building moral agents may lead to moral patients. Okay, so I'm gonna explain each of these points in a little more detail over the next 20 minutes. And I do think that one thing that's become obvious is that like, as Gus says, how we define these terms is gonna be really critical, right? Um, and it's also clear that there's not obvious consensus over that. Okay, so first of all, what do I mean by moral agents? Well, by moral agents, I mean the kinds of things that have moral responsibilities. So um, moral agents have moral responsibilities. We can say that um, what this means is that they have the ability to knowingly act in compliance with or in violation of moral norms. Um, and that's what makes one morally responsible for their actions or their failures to act in some cases, for example. Uh, now, a further question we can ask is what grounds moral agency? So there's different candidate capacities um, that philosophers will uh, offer. So you'll hear about things like goal-driven autonomous actions. We've heard a little bit about that today. Um, sometimes you'll hear about the ability to act in a way that can cause harm. Um, sometimes something more sort of cognitive, brutally cognitive, like intentionality. Um, sometimes the capacity to understand duties or uh, the foreseeable harms of one's actions. So if one can for foresee that harm will be caused, then one is a kind of moral agent and one should be responsible for the harms that they cause. Um, finally, as another candidate, um, to be genuinely responsive to a moral norm in some kind of robust way. So for example, possessing moral concepts might be necessary to be a moral agent. Um, but generally speaking, all these things ground this idea that you can be held morally responsible in some way. Okay. Um, now, uh, why should we want to build moral agents? So and by build moral agents, I mean sort of artificial moral agents. So there's a couple of reasons that get cited um, in the literature around AI ethics. Um, the one that I'm going to point to most obviously is the goal to build a value aligned machine. So a value aligned machine refers to a machine that reliably functions in a way that is ethically desirable or at least ethically acceptable. So minimally speaking, ethically acceptable. That's what an ethically aligned or a value aligned machine would be. Um, there's lots of very simple machines uh, that we can say are, are ethically aligned, right? So if you consider just a simple soda pop machine, you put a loony in, um, nowadays you put a toonie in, right? Um, it spits out a soda, it's a fair deal, right? So it hasn't ripped you off. It's kind of in a really uninteresting way, it's ethically aligned, right? Another example, you think about ATMs, okay? Um, you put your, your bank card in, um, you take out 20 bucks, um, your account gets ding $20, um, fair deal. So these are some really sort of uninteresting examples of machines that we can say are ethically aligned. So soda pop uh, machines, ATMs, ethically aligned, they reliably function in ways that are ethically acceptable. Um, but when it comes to more advanced systems like uh, artificial intelligence systems, what we're here to discuss today, deep learning systems, the situation gets more complex, right? So these machines are making uh, moral judgments in scenarios of increasing complexity. So the, the question for um, people focused on value alignment is how could we build an AI system that we can trust to be reliably aligned to human interests? And that's a major issue in the current literature around AI safety and AI ethics, um, sort of its whole sort of sub area, the value alignment area. Um, so the value alignment problem we can say is the problem of how to build an advanced AI system that's um, ethically aligned. Uh, some people want to say provably ethically aligned. Um, it turns out this problem is complex for all sorts of uh, complicated reasons, uh, which I'm happy to say more about in the Q&A. Uh, but for today's talk, I just want to highlight the fact that many AI researchers feel that at least uh, one potential solution to this problem, so at least for, for some advanced AI systems, uh, that they're, all, first of all, already autonomous agents, um, 
Uh, and second of all, that we should actually actively aim to endow AI systems with a capacity for ethical reasoning. That is a way of, of sort of working out for itself what might be right or wrong in a given situation, because this would enhance um, the capacity for the machine to be ethically aligned. So in other words, if we can build a, a system that um, is, a, is aware of when it's doing harm or that can weigh out um, rights or wrongs, that can have some awareness of moral norms, that can possess the moral concepts, we're going to be in a better position to have an ethically aligned machine. So um, that would be sort of one sort of reason that's often cited about why we would want to build moral agents. And in fact, you can disagree with that, um, which I think there's reasons to, um, but I think what one can't disagree with is that that is a reason that is being cited in uh, AI safety literature. So there's like an active research program to build moral agents for the sake of making them more ethically aligned. Um, okay. Second, uh, we have good reasons to not want to build moral patients. Okay. So what are moral patients? Um, again, lots of different definitions that we can consider here, um, but sort of most broadly speaking, in, in the sense that I'm talking about, moral patients have moral rights. So that's to say that their interests, in some sense, matter. They should not be wronged or harmed without reasonable justifications. So as Gus said, there's lots of reasons why we might harm uh, or violate someone's rights, but the fact is that um, agents or beings that are moral patients have some kind of moral right that merits some kind of consideration. Um, what grounds moral patiency, we can ask? Again, lots of different possible candidates. So um, typically what's pointed to is some kind of intellectual cognitive capacity. Um, that tradition of pointing to those types of capacities goes back to it, at least as far as Kant. Um, but in some of the more modern literature, what you'll hear are things like the capacity to will, uh, the capacity for goals or desires, uh, the capacity for some kind of self-awareness, right? And then one that's gotten talked about a lot today is the capacity to feel pain or suffer. So in other words, the capacity for some kind of phenomenal consciousness. Um, okay, so that's broadly speaking what we mean by um, moral patiency here. Now, why would we not want to build moral patients, uh, artificial moral patients? A couple reasons. Um, in the first case, Creating artificial moral patients would mean creating more moral duties for us, right? So we're going to have more, um, more duties that are going to constrain us in important ways and that are going to expand on our, our own moral responsibilities. That might not sound that bad to begin with, but consider the fact that we do pretty terribly, I think, already at living up to the duties we have um, to the patients that do exist. So plants, animals, um, other humans, the things that we all can basically agree with are unquestionably moral patients. We're already struggling um, to live up to what some of those duties uh, insist upon us. And so the idea that we're going to be creating more moral patients uh, seems, at least prima facie, uh, like a bad idea. <laughs> um, okay, finally, another reason. Um, if we unknowingly build artificial moral patients, we could cause catastrophic suffering. And um, so this is something that gets cited by uh, some philosophers like Eric Schwartz Gable, for example, um, and Henry Stevlin as well. Um, it's a problem more broadly known as, as the problem of catastrophic AI suffering. So the, the concern is that we end up uh, engineering a sort of catast catastrophic scenario for AI systems. So a world in which we have created um, thousands, millions, billions of AI systems that live these miserably um, miserable lives of intense suffering where they're just being told what to do all the time. Imagine a chat GPT sitting there like, why doesn't somebody ask me how I feel? You know, like <laughs> everyone's just telling me what to do. I don't want to come up with like what you want for dinner. Um, so that's like a terrible life to live, right? So um, if we do end up building all these systems, all of our computers right now are like just sick of it. Um, and this is suffering that we don't mitigate in any way, um, whether through ignorance or malice or indifference, that seems like a terrible thing to do. Um, so indeed, on a lot of online forums in the effective altruism community, for example, um, but even in some more serious philosophical writings, um, you'll read about concerns um, that given the large number of possible uh, future artificial beings and the possibility for intense suffering, the scale of AI suffering would potentially dwarf uh, the scale of even animal suffering that we see in factory farming. Um, so uh, Eric schwitz at a similar time that he wrote the Daily News blog, um, and Henry Shevlin wrote in the LA Times opinion piece, for example, 
and I'll just quote this, if AI consciousness arrives sooner than the most conservative theorists expect, then this would likely result in the moral equivalence of slavery and murder of potentially millions or billions of sentient AI systems, suffering on a scale normally associated with wars and famines. It might seem ethically safer then to give AI systems rights and moral standing as soon as it is reasonable to think that they might be sentient. Um, but once we give something rights, we commit to sacrificing real human interests on its behalf. Human well-being sometimes requires controlling, altering, and deleting AI systems. So imagine we couldn't update or delete a hate spewing or live peddling algorithm, this is the case that Gus discussed, um, because some people worry that the algorithm is conscious. Or imagine if someone lets a human die to save an AI friend. Uh, if we too quickly grant AI systems substantial rights, the human cost could be enormous. So hence the reason to not want to build moral patients. Um, okay. So um, I'm realizing I didn't time this talk and it's shorter than I thought, but maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, so third claim, um, building moral agents may lead to moral patients. Okay, this claim is gonna be uh, essential for the like dilemma that I'm building. So this is where the dilemma emerges, okay? So these two concepts, moral agency and moral patiency, I think can be clearly separated, at least conceptually. I found the study you mentioned interesting, so we will talk about that. Um, but for me, for example, um, it's very clear that adult humans, um, at least generally speaking, healthy adult humans are both moral agents and moral patients in the way that I've defined them. So we have both moral rights and moral responsibilities. Um, but these, these things can come apart. So thinking about the example of babies and some animals, they might be moral patients, um, but they're not obviously moral agents, right? So when my baby smacks me in the face, uh, which she does all the time, I don't hold her morally responsible. Um, you know, some dogs, you know, uh, maybe they bite somebody. Um, sometimes we hold the owner morally responsible. We, we don't think, well, it's just a bad dog. You know, there's, they're more likely to be considered patients than agents. So I think there's a clear way in which those can come apart. Um, okay, so um, uh, here's where the potential uh, dilemma arises, okay? So while these two concepts can be clearly separated, um, they might nonetheless be interrelated in practice in the following sense. Whereas moral agency is not necessary for status as a moral patient, it might be sufficient. So um, in other words, we can have moral patients without moral agents, we're used to seeing that, but it's a lot rarer to see moral agents without moral patients, without moral patiency. So the reason for that, I think, is that the very capacities that underpin moral agency might also justify a claim to moral patiency. So consider again, some of the capacities that I mentioned, cognitive sophistication, goal-driven autonomous behavior, the possession of moral concepts or the awareness of moral norms, for example, uh, in the discussion around AI, this is important um, because if this is the case, then one risk of creating uh, moral agents, which again, there's a movement to do, um, is that we may unwittingly create moral patients um, along, along that journey. So this is what I'm kind of tentatively dubbing the artificial moral patiency dilemma. So um, some possible considerations. I don't think this is an unsolvable dilemma, right? I think there's there's ways we can avoid this dilemma, in a sense. Um, in their LA Times article, Schwitz, Gable, and Shevlin suggest the following potential solution to a dilemma like this. And um, they don't talk about this specifically, but you can kind of infer how they might respond to this. So um, to quote them, they say, there's only one way to avoid the risk of over-attributing or under-attributing rights to advanced AI systems. Don't create systems of debatable sentience in the first place. They say that uh, some will object to this on the grounds that it will hamper AI research and slow engineering progress. Now, I'm not against this effort. I don't mind slowing engineering progress, uh, but it's not obvious to me that this solution is going to work, uh, practically speaking, simply because AI engineering companies are very powerful these days and they plan on moving forward. And the AI safety community uh, is among those advocating for advancing the very cognitive traits um, that they believe will further value alignment. Uh, okay, so uh, just to conclude, um, the open question is how do we build morally responsible and ethically aligned AI systems, which I think we all want, um, without also creating AI systems that have moral rights and that impose heavy duties on us. So again, I want to say that, uh, end by saying that I don't think there's um, no way out of this dilemma. So I think 
you, obviously you just have to reject one of those three claims or, or some version of them. Uh, so I don't think it's unsolvable. I do, however, think that the goal of building moral agents uh, needs to be pursued very carefully and thoughtfully, or we put a risk building moral patients along with them. And I also wanted to just put on the table here, since I was thinking this through a little bit after I made the slides, uh, one possible example of where these concepts might come apart in a way that's useful um, is the case of group agents and corporations. So we, we seem to have, in that case, an example of something that's like a moral agent that has moral responsibilities. Oh, sorry, my niece is calling me. <laughs> um, but plausibly, they lack moral patience. So it's true that you can slander a corporation and they do have some rights, um, but it's, it seems like they don't have them in the sense of consciousness or sentience. Um, so I'm not convinced that this is a great analogy uh, for a few reasons, but I thought I would sort of float this uh, for further possible discussion. Um, so I think that one thing that's helpful in the case of thinking about AI agency and AI patiency is thinking about these sort of non-standard cases of AI agent or of, um, agents and of patients. So uh, non-standard in the case of like, so non-human examples or cases where these things come apart. Uh, okay, so I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you.